Rejection, Mariama Ba. My own crisis came three years after your own. But unlike in your case, the source was not my family-in-law. The problem was rooted in Mordu himself, my husband. My daughter, Daba, who was preparing for her baccalaureate, often brought some of her classmates home with her. Most of the time it was the same young girl, a bit shy, frail, made noticeably uncomfortable by our style of life. But she was really beautiful in this her adolescent period, in her faded but clean clothes. Her beauty shone, pure, her shapely contours could not but be noticed. I sometimes noticed that Mordu was interested in the pair. Neither was I worried when I heard him suggest that he should take Benitu home in the car because it was getting late, he would say. Benitu was going through a metamorphosis, however. She was now wearing very expensive off-the-peg dresses. Smilingly, she would explain to my daughter, Oh, I have a sugar daddy who pays for them. Then, one day on her return from school, Daba confided in me that Benitu had a serious problem. The sugar daddy of the boutique dresses wants to marry Benitu. Just imagine! Her parents want to withdraw her from school, with only a few months to go before the back, to marry her off to the sugar daddy. Advise her to refuse, I said. And if the man in question offers her a villa, mecca for her parents, a car, a monthly allowance, jewels, none of that is worth the capital of youth. I agree with you, mum. I'll tell Benito not to give in. But her mother is a woman who wants so much to escape from mediocrity and who regrets so much her past beauty faded in the smoke from the wood fires that she looks enviously at everything I wear. She complains all day long. What is important is Benito herself. She must not give in. And then, a few days afterwards, Daba renewed the conversation with its surprising conclusion. Mum, Benito is heartbroken. She is going to marry her sugar daddy. Her mother cried so much. She begged her daughter to give her life a happy end in a proper house as the man has promised them. So she accepted. When is the wedding? This coming Sunday. But there will be no reception. Benito cannot bear the mockery of her friends. And in the evening of the same Sunday on which Benito was being married off, I saw come into my house, all dressed up and solemn, Tamzia, Mordu's brother, with Mardo Bar and his local imam. Where had they come from, looking so awkward in their starched boo-boos? Doubtless they had come looking for Mordu to carry out an important task that one of them had been charged with. I told them that Mordu had been out since morning. They entered laughing, deliberately sniffing the fragrant odor of incense that was floating on the air. I sat in front of them, laughing with them. The imam attacked. There is nothing one can do when Allah the Almighty puts two people side by side. True, true, said the other two in support. A pause. He took a breath and continued. There is nothing new in this world. True, true. Tamzia and Mardo chimed in again. Some things we may find to be sad are much less so in others. I followed the movement of the haughty lips that let fall these axioms, which can precede the announcement of either a happy event or an unhappy one. What was he leading up to with these preliminaries that rather announced a storm? So their visit was obviously planned. Does one announce bad news dressed up like that in one's Sunday best? Or did they want to inspire confidence with their impeccable dress? I thought of the absent one. I asked with a cry of a hunted beast, Mordu and the imam who had finally got hold of a leading thread held tightly onto it. He went on quickly as if the words were glowing embers in his mouth. Yes, more to fall but happily he is alive for you for all of us, thanks be to God. All he has done is to marry a second wife today. We have just come from the mosque in Grand Dakar where the marriage took place. The thorns thus removed from the way Tamzia ventured. Mordu sends his thanks. He says it is fate that decides men and things. God intended him to have a second wife. There is nothing he can do about it. He praises you for the quarter of a century of marriage in which you gave him all the happiness a wife owes her husband. His family, especially myself, his elder brother, thank you. You have always held us in respect. You know that we are Mordu's blood. Afterwards, they were the same old words which were intended to relieve the situation. You are the only one in your house, no matter how big it is, no matter how dear life is. You are the first wife, a mother for Mordu, a friend for Mordu. Tamsi as Adam's apple danced about in his throat. He shook his left leg, crossed over his folded right leg. His shoes 
white Turkish slippers were covered with a thin layer of red dust, the color of the earth in which they had walked. The same dust covered Mardo's and the imam's shoes. Mardo said nothing. He was reliving his own experience. He was thinking of your letter, your reaction, and you and I were so alike. He was being wary. He kept his head lowered in the attitude of those who accept defeat before the battle. I acquiesced under the drops of poison that were burning me. A quarter of a century of marriage, a wife unparalleled. I counted backwards to determine where the break in the thread had occurred from which everything had unwound. My mother's voice came back to me, too perfect. I completed at last my mother's thought were the end of the dictum, to be honest. I thought of the first two incisors with a wide gap between them, the sign of the primacy of love in the individual. I thought of his absence all day long. He had simply said, don't expect me for lunch. I thought of the other absences, quite frequent these days, crudely clarified today, yet well hidden yesterday under the guise of trade union meetings. He was also on a strict diet to break the stomach's egg, he would say laughingly, this egg that denounced old age. Every night when he went out, he would unfold and try on several of his suits before settling on one. The others, impatiently rejected, would slip to the floor. I would have to fold them again and put them back in their place. And this extra work, I discovered, I was doing only to help him in his effort to be elegant in his seduction of another woman. I forced myself to check my inner agitation. Above all, I must not give my visitors the pleasure of relating my distress. Smile, take the matter lightly, just as they announced it. Thank them for the humane way in which they have accomplished their mission. Saying thanks to Mordu, a good father and a good husband. A husband become a friend. Thank my family-in-law, the imam, Mordu, Smile, give them something to drink, see them out under the swirls of incense that they were sniffing once again, shake their hands. How pleased they were, all except Mardo, who correctly summed up the import of the event. Alone at last, able to give free rein to my surprise and to measure my distress. Ah, yes, I forgot to ask for my rival's name so that I might give a human form to my pain. My question was soon answered. Acquaintances from Grand Dakar came rushing to my house, bringing the various details details of the ceremony. Some of them did so out of true friendship for me. Others were spiteful and jealous of the promotion Benito's mother would gain from the marriage. I don't understand. They did not understand either the entrance of Mordu, a personality into this extremely poor family. Benito, a child the same age as my daughter Daba, promoted to the rank of my co-wife, whom I must face up to. Shy Benito, the old man who brought her the new off-the-peg dresses to replace the old faded ones, was none other other than Mordu. She had innocently confided her secrets to her rival's daughter because she thought that this dream, sprung from a brain growing old, would never become reality. She had told everything, the villa, the monthly allowance, the offer of a future trip to Mecca for her parents. She thought she was stronger than the man she was dealing with. She did not know Mordu's strong will, his tenacity before an obstacle, the pride he invests in winning, the resistance that inspires new attempts at each failure. Dahaba was furious, her pride wounded. She repeated all the nicknames Benito had given her father, old man, pot belly, sugar daddy. The person who gave her life had been daily ridiculed and he accepted it. An overwhelming anger raged inside Dahaba. She knew that her best friend was sincere in what she said, but what can a child do, faced with a furious mother shouting about her hunger and her thirst to live. Benito, like many others, was a lamb slaughtered on the altar of affluence. Daba's anger increased as she analyzed the situation. Break with him, mother. Send this man away. He has respected neither you nor me. Do what Auntie Isatu did. Break with him. Tell me you'll break with him. I can't see you fighting over a man with a girl my age. I told myself what every betrayed woman says. If Mordu was milk, it was was I who had had all the cream. The rest, well, nothing but water with a vague smell of milk. But the final decision lay with me. With Mordu absent all night, was he already consummating his marriage? The solitude that lends counsel enabled me to grasp the problem. Leave? Start again at zero? After living 25 years with one man? After having born 12 children? I take a deep breath. 
I've related at one go your story as well as mine. I've said the essential. For pain, even when it's past, leaves the same marks on the individual when recalled. Your disappointment was mine, as my rejection was yours. Forgive me once again if I have reopened your wound. Mine continues to bleed. You may tell me the path of life is not smooth. One is bruised by its sharp edges. I also know that marriage is never smooth. It reflects differences in character and capacity for feeling. In one couple, the man may be the victim of a fickle woman or of a woman shut up in her own preoccupations who rejects all dialogue and quashes all moves towards tenderness. In another couple, alcoholism is the leprosy that gnaws away at health, wealth and peace. It shows up an individual's disordered state through grotesque spectacles by which his dignity is undermined. In situations where physical blows become solid arguments and the menacing blade of a knife an irresistible call for silence. With others, it is the lure of easy gain that dominates. Incorrigible players at the gaming table or seated in the shade of a tree. The heated atmosphere of rooms full of fiendish odours. The distorted faces of tense players. The giddy whirl of playing cards swallowed up time wealth, conscience, and stops only with the last breath of the person accustomed to shuffling them. I tried to spot my faults in the failure of my marriage. I gave freely, gave more than I received. I'm one of those who can realize themselves fully and bloom truly when they form part of a couple. Even though I understand your stand, even though I respect the choice of liberated women, I have never conceived of happiness outside marriage. I loved my house. You can testify to the fact that I made it a haven of peace where everything had its place, that I created a harmonious symphony of colors. You know how soft-hearted I am, how much I I loved Mordu. You can testify to the fact that, mobilized day and night in his service, I anticipated his slightest desire. I made peace with his family. Despite his desertion of our home, his father and mother and Tamzia, his brother, still continued to visit me often, as did his sisters. My children, too, grew up without much ado. Their success at school was my pride, just like laurels thrown at the feet of my lord and master. And Mordu was no prisoner. He spent his time as he wished. I well understood his desire to let off steam. He fulfilled himself outside as he wished in his trade union activities. I am trying to pinpoint any weakness in the way I conducted myself. My social life may have been stormy and perhaps injured Mordu's trade union career. Can a man, deceived and flouted by his family, impose himself on others? Can a man whose wife does not do her job well honestly demand a fair reward for labor? Aggression and condescension in a woman arouse contempt and hatred for her husband. If she is gracious, even without appealing to ideology, she can summon support for any action. In a word, a man's success depends on feminine support. And I ask myself, I ask myself why? Why did Mordu detach himself? Why did he put Benito between us? You, very logically, may reply, affections spring from nothing. Sometimes a grimace, the carriage of a head, can seduce a heart and keep it. I ask myself questions. The truth is that, despite everything, I remain faithful to the love of my youth. I saw to, I cry for Mordu, and I can do nothing about it. Yesterday, I celebrated, as is the custom, the 40th day of Mordu's death. I have forgiven him. May God hear the prayer I say for him every day. I celebrated the 40th day in meditation. The initiated read the Quran. Their fervent voices rose towards heaven. Mordu fall, my God accept you among his chosen few. After going through the motions of piety, Tamzia came and sat in my bedroom in the blue armchair that used to be your favorite. Sticking his head outside, he signaled to Modo. He also signaled to the imam from the mosque in his area. The imam and Modo joined him. This time, Tamzia spoke. There's a striking resemblance between Modu and Tamzia. The same ticks donated by the inexplicable law of heredity. Tamzia speaks with great assurance. He touches once again on my years of marriage. And then he concludes, When you have come out, that is to say, of mourning, I shall marry you. You suit me as a wife, and further, you will continue to live here, just as if Mordu were not dead. Usually it is the younger brother who inherits his elder brother's wife. In this case, it is the opposite. You are my good luck. I shall marry you. I prefer you to the other one. Too frivolous, too young. I advise Mordu against that marriage. What a declaration of love, full of conceit, in a house still in mourning. What assurance and calm aplomb. I look Tamzia straight in the eye. I look at Mado. I look at the Imam. I draw my black shawl closer. 
I tell my beads, this time I shall speak out. My voice has known 30 years of silence, 30 years of harassment. It bursts out violent, sometimes sarcastic, sometimes contentious. Did you ever have any affection for your brother? Already you want to build a new home for yourself over a body that is still warm. While we are praying for Mordu, you are thinking of future wedding festivities. Ah, oh, yes, your strategy is to get in before any other suitor, to get in before Mardo, the faithful friend who has more qualities than you and who also, according to custom, can inherit the wife. You forget that I have a heart, a mind, that I'm not an object to be passed from hand to hand. You don't know what marriage means to me. It is an act of faith and of love, the total surrender of oneself to the person one has chosen and who has chosen you. I emphasize the word chosen. What of your wives, Tamsia? Your income can meet neither their needs nor or those of your numerous children. To help you out with your financial obligations, one of your wives dies, another sells fruit, the third untiringly turns the needle of a sewing machine. You, the revered Lord, you take it easy, obey at the crook of a finger. I shall never be the one to complete your collection. My house shall never be for you the coveted oasis, no extra burden. My turn every day, cleanliness and luxury, abundance and calm. No, Tamsia. And then there are Daba and her husband who have demonstrated their financial acumen by buying up all your brother's properties. What promotion for you. Your friends are going to look at you with envy in their eyes. Mardo signaled with his hand for me to stop. Shut up. Shut up. Stop. Stop. But you can't stop once you've let your anger loose. I concluded, more violent than ever. Tamsia, purge yourself of your dreams of conquest. I have lasted 40 days. I shall never be your wife. The imam prayed God to be his witness. Such profane words and still in mourning, Tamsia got up without a word. He understood fully that he'd been defeated. Thus, I took my revenge for that other day when all three of them had airily informed me of the marriage of Mordufal and Benitu.